one of the shifts that we've seen in recent years is that diversity has become a synonym for equality. Yes. <laughs> They're very different things. We tend to look at um, minorities as belonging to communities. And that class is something that applies largely to the white population. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a diverse society, but we've got a diverse society, which is deeply unequal. You know, a diverse elite is still an elite. We live in a world where politicians, activists, corporations are happy to talk about political equality, but don't want to do anything about economic inequality. And the point is that that affects minorities because minorities are disproportionately working class and poor. Those deep fundamental questions about the kind of societies we live in no longer get asked. How do we fix this? Can we fix this? Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our terrific guest today is a writer and broadcaster who's written very interesting things, but particularly about the issue of race. His latest book on the same subject is called Not So Black and White, From White Supremacy to Identity Politics. Ken and Malik, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. It's been a long time coming. We've been keen to have you on the show for ages. You kept saying, I'll come on when I've got my book out. I'll come on. <laughs> Here you are. Um, before we get into the conversation, which we're both really excited to have with you, uh, tell us, who are you? How are you where you are? What has been the journey through life that's led you to be sitting here talking to us? Um, if I was to tell you my journey through life, it'll take the whole program. So let me just say, I'm, a, I'm a, mainly a writer these days. Uh, and I've come into writing uh, out of social and political activism. And much of my writing is about putting contemporary social, political issues in a broader frame, a broader uh, historical frame. So we, we, we're tendency to look at issues as they are at the moment. Um, and that tells us actually very little about it because you need to know not just where you are, but how you've got there. Um, and so you need to tell the backstory, as it were. And, and my, my latest book, the one you talked about, uh, Not So Black and White, does that in relation to race. It, it, in a sense, the, at the heart of it is a paradox of contemporary society, which is that on the one hand, most societies, um, there's a great abhorrence of racism. Um, not that racism has disappeared, uh, it still disfigures the lives of many, but that there's a, at a moral level, most societies um, are, are poor racism. Even racists say, oh, I'm not racist, but. <laughs> um, at the same time, we are, um, we continually put people into racial and ethnic boxes. Um, we define the, uh, people by the box, their, their needs, their aspirations, um, the policies that should apply to them according to those boxes into which they've been put. And it's as if the more we abhor racism, the more we're drawn to that kind of racialization. And the book is an attempt to to, to address that by looking at how we've got to where we are. So it's partly a history of race, uh, the idea of race, and it's partly a history of the challenge to racism um, and to uh, racial categorization. And uh, mostly it's, it's, it's about the intersection of those two, because it's the intersection of those two histories that tell us um, uh, a lot about uh, the contemporary world and, and, and where we are, how, how we've got to where we are and where, why we are where we are. Mm. And I would argue there is another dimension or another paradox perhaps, which is certainly I came to this country in 1995. I would argue the transformation in our attitudes to minorities of all kinds in that period of time has been remarkable. And, and starting from, by global standards, quite a high base already. I mean, by global standards, Britain was quite a tolerant society anyway. It's got more tolerant or welcoming or whatever the right word is. I'm not saying it was perfect, of course. Yet the conversation that we have about that issue has only seemed to intensify in pitch and volume and sort of screaming, particularly in the last six to seven years. Would you agree with that? It certainly, Britain has improved um, uh, and become far more relaxed about issues of race and of immigration 
um, than it was when I was growing up. I, w- I wouldn't say it was particularly tolerant when I was growing mm. up. I mean, I grew up in a very different Britain where um, racism was visceral and vicious and where firebombings and uh, stabbings were, were, were routine. Um, where, you know, I, 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 it'd be rare for me to come back home from school without being in a, having been in a fight. Um, it was a largely white school I went to. Um, and we live in a very different Britain today. Um, uh, that, uh, it's not that racism has disappeared, but that kind of in-your-face vicious racism is thankfully very rare. Um, and yes, there, there is a paradox that, that, that um, the, the more relaxed Britain is, um, the more tolerant it is in relation to race, the more we talk about it. Um, and I, th- I think it's in, it, it part, it, it, again, it's part of what I try and address um, as to the reasons why. And, it, and it actually has very little to do with race itself. I mean, it's partly to do with race in the sense that um, the, that even though the, that, that kind of um, in-your-face racism is, 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 is largely gone, nevertheless, for those who live today, today's generation, the kinds of um, uh, issues they face, to them, is, 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 is uh, material. Um, and they, they, a lot of them would, would, would feel that, for instance, we know that in the, in the, in the job market, there is structural racism in the sense that um, study after study has shown that if you send out um, uh, CVs, identical CVs, but with different names on it, so one appears white, in inverted commas, other appears um, Asian, um, Muslim, whatever, that you get very different responses to identical CVs. That if you're, if you're seen to be um, white, you're more likely to get uh, interviews, more likely to get a job. Um, we've seen the, the report on the Met, for instance, and the recent report on the Met. So um, uh, we should not ignore all that. Mm, of course. Um, but at the same time, I think that the reason that, um, that race seems so, to, to, to kind of, um, uh, to figure so much in, in people's lives or, or to shape the way we think about the world has actually little to do with race itself. It's to do with the broader decline of what I'd call uh, the, the radical universalist tradition. Now, when, when I, again, when I was growing up, the um, racism was fierce, but the left held on to a, a, a universalist position, the idea of um, equal rights for all, um, that racism was about, or anti-racism, was about challenging the, um, the, 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 the failure to treat people equally. Um, over space of just a decade, perhaps, through the 80s, um, the left lost much of its uh, universalist perspective. It became much more drawn towards um, a particular identitarian viewpoint. And the reason for that is uh, has, has to do with the broader context um, of, of the left. Um, there have always been identitarian strains within anti-racist, anti-colonial movements. If you go back to um, the 19th century, you had the Back to Africa movements, you had Garveyism in the, in the early 20th century, Pan-Africanism, Negritude, and so on. But these movements were, were largely relatively marginal. That the main, um, the main motive of the struggles for, for equality against colonialism, against racism, um, those struggles were driven by a universalist perspective um, and all the great movements that made the modern world from anti-colonial movements, anti-apartheid movements, the battles for, for gay rights and so on, battles for women's rights and so on, have all been, were driven by that sense of uh, uh, a universalist perspective. But that kind of radical universalism depends on uh, rests on, on, on the idea that, on, on the belief that you can transform society, that um, change is possible. And that belief has ebbed over the past 40, 50 years because the, the, the kind of the, the, 
the radical social movements have disintegrated, the labour movements has, has, has decayed, um, uh, organisations such as trade unions um, uh, have lost influence, the left has lost influence. Um, and so people have been drawn more and more into um, their own more, much more narrow identities as, as a kind of refuge almost. Um, and the more you, you can, you're, you're within that box, within that cage of, of identity, the more the whole world um, can only be seen through, those, through, that, through, through, through that box or that, or, or that cage. And so that more and more, it feels as if that's the only way to understand the world. And it seems to me that the, 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 the rise of identitarianism has actually much less to do with what people talk about in terms of um, identities or race, or much more to do with the decline of the, that broader sense of possibilities of social change. There's such a profound point, Kenan, because when you looked at 2020 and the killing of George Floyd and then the rise to prominence of the BLM movement, and you looked at what they stood for, it was hardline Marxist agenda, abolish capitalism, you know, the nuclear family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people who espouse those sort of views are effectively saying, society isn't working for me, and the only way it can work for me is if we get rid of everything and then start again. Well, we could have a discussion about Black Lives Matter and, 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 and what it stood for. Um, my critique of it would be different from yours. Yeah. Um, but I think th th there is a kind of, what, what happens is that that kind of um, anti-capitalism, that kind of against the system, tends to be more gestural, rhetorical than... Um, than there being any reality to it. Because the kinds of movements um, that, that once existed, that gave those kinds of rhetoric um, uh, reality, no longer exist. And so it becomes um, largely rhetorical. And what effect do you think that has on society, that we have gone from this universalist position, which you explained so beautifully, to where we are now, which is a far more identitarian, is that a positive? Uh, are there elements of it that are positive? Is it largely negative? It's largely negative. Um, because, it, because that sense of social pessimism I was talking about, that uh, belief that you can't um, overcome the fissures of race and, and identity, that, that, that those divisions are, are too great. Um, if you believe that, then, then inevitably, your, the, the meaning of anti-racism changes. It changes from being um, a, a movement for material change to a, a movement for symbolic, representational change. It becomes um, a, a movement that um, relies on, on making white people feel guilty rather than actually bringing about change for, for um, uh, minorities. Going back to this Black Lives Matter movement. My, my, my critique uh, at one at, at the level that that, that, it, that of the slogan, um, it's an important slogan. I mean, well, it's, no it's, one it's, in it's, the it's, world it, would disagree with sure, that. Of course, that, that it's, it's not saying that only Black Lives Matter. Yeah. but that in a world in which um, George Floyd was killed, in which there are disproportionate killings of um, uh, of, of Black people in America um, by the police, then. Um, the idea is black lives matter means black lives also matter. Um, they should matter equally. But the real problem, it seems to me, with, with, with black lives matter is, the, is, the, is that it confuses the fighting racism with building racial solidarity. And they're two different things. Mm. Um, the, the idea of a global black family it's a confected unity. There is no such thing because um, black communities, as much as any other community, are um, broken down, fractured by um, class, by uh, gender, um, all sorts of things. By and, culture and, and geographical sure. origin. I mean, That's the Afro-Caribbean right. to African differences sure. are very sure. stark. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so one of the stories I tell in the book is about a... Uh, 
a strike, a sanitation worker strike in New Orleans. Um, it, they were, the, the sanitation workers in, in New Orleans, and if you know anything about the history of, of American um, uh, labour relations, you'll know the importance of sanitation workers' strikes. They kind of played an important part in, in, in American history, and including American black history. And it was a, a famous sanitation worker strike in Memphis um, in, in, in the 1960s, uh, which um, Martin Luther King was visiting um, uh, to give support, one of the most important strikes in, in the 60s in America. Um, uh, he, it's, it's, he was visiting them when he was shot, when he was assassinated. Anyway, the, the New Orleans strike, um, sanitation worker strike, uh, began in um, early 2020. Um, and virtually all the workers were, were black. Um, and they, were, they, they came out on strike because of poverty wages, because of a lack of equipment, um, protective equipment during COVID, uh, and because of a, a refusal to be allowed to unionise. But if all the workers were black, it was also a black-owned company because as part of its anti-racist drive, New Orleans had subcontracted out its sanitation work to a black company, a black-owned company. And what Black Lives Matter meant was very different on the two sides of the picket line. It was very different. What Black Lives Matter meant to... Um, uh, the black workers. It's very different from what Black Lives Matter meant to black employers. So the, the workers came out on strike about three weeks, I think, before George Floyd was killed. That was the summer of um, when, when, when Black Lives Matter and, and, and um, the idea um, of, of racism and, and the need to fight against racism became a global issue. And they were on strike right throughout that summer, forced back to work, that, December, uh, that September, having won virtually none of their demands, despite um, racism being at the top of um, uh, people's agenda. So what does that mean? It meant that the black employers won, the black workers lost. In other words, Black Lives Matter um, cannot be understood in terms simply in, in, in a kind of global sense, because it depends on where you stand in your, in, in your class position. Are you an employer or are you a worker? Are you well paid or are you badly paid? Um, and what, what, what it suggests or what it shows is that if you create this kind of false unity um, of a black community, it helps the, 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 um, uh, the black middle class. It helps those within the black community who are already privileged but it does very little for uh, uh, black people at the bottom of the pile. Um, African-Americans are disproportionately working class. But because um, our, 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 our sense of, what, of, of um, what we need to do is defend the black community as a whole, then actually their um, aspirations, their needs get lost. And the needs and aspirations of middle-class blacks are the ones that are catered to. So it sounds like your critique is that as we abandon a more class and economics-based analysis and move towards a more identitarian one, that leaves out the complexities of how people live. And so actually the poorest people in the black community in this case get left behind because no one is advocating for them because they're poor. They're being advocated for because of the color of their skin, but it's not very effective at getting them further up or improvements in their lives. Is that broadly what you're saying? Um, uh, to, to a large extent. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, one of the shifts that we've seen in recent years is the, that diversity has become a synonym for equality. Yes. <laughs> and they're, two, they're very different things. Quite I agree. I mean, pe people um, talk about diversity um, for very good reasons. They're, 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 um, that there are lots of marginalised groups that have been kept left out of society, left out of the gains of society, uh, and it is necessary to, to, to bring them into um, those gains of society. But um, you can have a diverse society, but we've got a diverse society, which is deeply unequal. Um, and so by talking about diversity rather than equality, 
um, or, or, or reducing equality of diversity, what you do is make, actually make the possibilities of equality that much more difficult because it becomes ignored. Um, you know, a, a diverse elite is still an elite. Um, and so it's important that, that, that we recognise that um, equality is not just about political equality, it's about economic equality too. And, and we live in a world where people are, um, where politicians, activists, corporations are happy to talk about political equality, but don't want to do anything about economic inequality. And the point is that that affects minorities because minorities are disproportionately working class and poor. And therefore, if you don't address that question, then you don't address um, the, 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 the actual needs of the majority of, um, of black or Asian people um, in Britain or America. Hey, Constantine, do you like being healthy? Of course. In my country, we judge man's health by his ability to wrestle bear. In London, I have since found out this has very different meaning. We've all had a night that's got out of hand. We will speak no more of this. The secret will be buried with my ancestors. Well, if you want to stay healthy and not feel like you need to be buried with Constantine's ancestors, then you need to try AG1. AG1 is simple and easy way to get all nutrients you need. Each serving contains 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. One scoop and you feel like real men. We used it on our America tour, where we were constantly on the move, living out of a bag and working every day. AG1 meant we felt great, looked great, and we avoided getting sick. One scoop a day meant we knew we had all the vitamins and minerals needed for the day. We had hugely successful trip. It is very economical and I felt strong enough to wrestle American bear, which we all know is grotesquely weak compared to great Russian bear. If you're looking for a simpler and cost-effective supplement routine, AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash trigonometry. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash trigonometry. That's drinkag1.com slash trigonometry. Check it out. Yes, check it out and become real men like me. Why are we not talking about the economics? Because to me, it seems a completely ridiculous discussion to talk about something like race and we go, you know, oh, you're people of colour. Well, people of colour can be anything from Rishi Sunak to someone of Pakistani origin growing up in Bradford in a desperately poor, deprived part of the UK. Why are we having such a, if I can put it bluntly, a, a ridiculous conversation? Because um, to have a, a conversation about economic inequality, um, you have to ask some fundamental questions about the way societies run, about um, the nature of markets, about the nature of profit, about putting profits before people's needs. You have to ask those kinds of difficult questions. And, and few people want to ask those questions. And the kinds of um, broader movements that raise those questions have disappeared. Um, it's, it's what I was talking about before, that... that, that um, the, 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 the collapse of um, broader radical social movements, of um, uh, working class movements, of trade unions, the, the loss of power of trade unions, um, have all played a role in it. Um, trade unions are hugely important. That, that, um, where trade unions are strong, inequality tends to be much lower than where trade unions are weak. Um, inequality in Britain and in America shot up in the 1980s when trade unions were smashed. Um, and they've stayed pretty high um, ever since. There, there's a, there is, you know, there is a, a relationship between um, the strength of trade unions and um, inequality. Um, and so uh, the, the answer is uh, because the kinds of those deep fundamental questions about the kind of societies we live in um, no longer get asked. And it's much easier then to talk about um, 
uh, rights at a political level um, than to talk about equality at an economic level. And Kenan, I think that may answer the question I was going to ask you. Just let me feed this back to you and tell me if I'm hearing you correctly. One of the, th the questions I had for you was, where does the pessimism come from, given the progress we've made on race? And by the way, I should add, I wasn't suggesting that Britain in the 80s was this beacon of uh, <laughs> cultural <laughs> universalism at all. I mean, I remember I came to school here in 95, and I remember me being called a packy, right? And I'm from Russia. So uh, I'm totally aware of what you're talking about. And I certainly wasn't suggesting that it was you know, perfect. But by global standards, actually, pretty good. However, are you suggesting that the pessimism about which you talk is not the product of the lack of progress we've made on race relations, it's a product of the inequality and the lack of progress we've made on that front, and therefore people feel like, well, there's nothing we can really do to change our material circumstances, therefore let's pursue this uh, more representative, more symbolic agenda. Is that what you're saying? I I'm saying that... that um to believe, to have a radical universalist perspective, to, to believe in, 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 in a, a universalism in, in, in any, any kind of um, material sense, you have to have belief that it is possible to transform society. Um, but this is my point, we have. And the, move, and the movement, well... This is my point, right? In terms of race, right, we have transformed society. In, in, yes. So why are people pessimistic about our ability to make progress? Because we, 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 we have got a, a, a society, societies where we've made progress when it comes to race, but which are still deeply unequal, where um, the, the, the impact of uh, poverty, the impact of um, lack of resources um, bites very deeply. Um, and the, the kinds of um, movements, organisations, politicians that used to defend um, uh, the working class, that did to defend the poor, um, have disappeared. So the Labour Party now says in this country, the Labour Party says, we're not going to get rid of the um, uh, two-child limits on, on benefits, even though um, that very week, um, when Keir Starmer made that announcement, um, there was a report which came out which showed that the, the, the impact of, of the um, two-child uh, limit on, on benefits was to hugely increase poverty among certain, certain sections of the population. Um, so, so while it, it's a good thing that we've made progress, um, that kind of progress has been for a very small section of, 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 of society. Um, um, and those who've most benefited from the kinds of progress we've made in race have been um, uh, middle-class uh, minorities. Um, Working-class minorities have benefited much less uh, from that, um, just as working-class uh, people as a whole have benefited much less um, over the past 30, 40 years. So, uh, so uh, it's that... What, it's, the, it's the way that the politics and the economics have become separated. And our discussion about political equality has become separated from our discussion about um, economic equality or inequality. Um, that's part of the problem. And the, the, the thing that I find frustrating about this speaking of identitarianism and, and this identitarianism movement is how reductive it is. So, for instance, it will talk about white... And they will say, like, for instance, to me, you're white. My mother's Latin American, a woman of color. We, you know, my grandfather was an Arab. My, my grandmother was descended from South American native. Yeah, but look at you, mate. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> mate. And I've got the accent and I've got tattoos. So, you know, <laughs> therefore equals racist. But the, the, the thing that I find really frustrating about it is that it seems to me that it was a way to demonize the white working class as well. And if I'm going to put it bluntly because it was like, well, you've got white privilege. And I always was like, hang on, somebody born in a council estate in Middlesbrough who is a product of a single mother, what, 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 what privilege do they have? They have no privilege. And yet they have somebody who is an ethnic minority who grew up in a very nice part of London lecturing this person, which to me, I mean, it's abhorrent, if I'm being honest. Yeah, again, you have, you have to separate two things. One is, why has it become the case that 
um, racism has been reduced to the quest of white privilege. Um, mm. And secondly, what are the consequences of that? Um, and if you look at how, why racism has become reduced to the quest of white privilege, again, you go back to what I've been talking about, um, which is that sense of social pessimism. Take something like critical race theory. There, there are lots of different discussions and critiques of, of critical race theory, some of which are good, some of which are, 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 are bad. But one thing that um, is rarely talked about in, in the thinking about critical race theory is that it's the kind of the broader political, social, co economic context in which critical race theory becomes um, uh, significant. One of the key figures um, of, of um, critical race theory, someone that um, very few people know about, but who was very important in, in developing it, was, was a guy called Derek Bell. Bell was a, uh, an American, um, African-American um, lawyer um, who has played an important part in, in um, uh, legal circles with, with, within America, um, who began um, as a lawyer working for the um, uh, National Association for, for Colored People in America, um, challenging segregation in the South. Um, and working to desegregate schools in particular in the South. And he became um, largely disenchanted by the lack of progress in that. And he came to see that, um, believe that racism was ineradicable, that it was there. It was, it, it was, it, um, uh, there was equality. Black people in America would never win equality. Um, and in a sense, that was un underlay many of the arguments of, of, of critical race theory, that, that, that sense of, um, of racism being ineradicable. Now, few people, however influential Derek Bell is, few people have fall so fallen down that kind of pit of existential despair as, as, as Bell did. Nevertheless, he's, he has been hugely influential um, on, fi on figures from, um, you know, Barack Obama to Michelle Alexander to, to, to a wide range of figures. And um, if you take a, a figure like Tanahisi Coates, um, who you may know about, he's possibly the most influential um, uh, African American essayist in, in, in America, um, just the most influential essayist in America. He sees, for instance, that racism. He compares racism to a natural disaster, like a typhoon or an earthquake. And he says, just as social movements or laws will never stop um, a typhoon or, a, or an earthquake, nor will it ever eradicate racism. And once you, 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 you kind of come to believe that, um, then kind of, there are a number of consequences of that. First, you, become, you come to see, it, it, see race as something fixed and racial divisions as something fixed. Um, you essentialize them. You, you kind of say that they're... Um, and so um, even though that's your, your starting point is that race is, is a social construct, your end point is that it is unmovable. R racial divisions are unmovable. And you come to almost the same position as, as those on the right who argue that uh, race is, <laughs> is um, a, a biological reality and racial differences are biological realities and policies should be um, um, related to that. It also means that, um, going back to what we were talking before, that, that um, the, the, the struggle against race, if, if you're struggling against racism at the same time as you believe that racism cannot be overcome, then you, you shift from what we were talking about before, from a, a, a view of a material change to a view of, uh, about symbolic change. And what matters then becomes symbolism and, and, and anti-racism becomes a kind of uh, a performative act. Um, and so a lot of what we're talking about, a lot of um, uh, the, the kind of critiques of anti-racism, uh, uh, contemporary anti-racism, stems, I think, 
Um, not from, you know, malice or, 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 or um, uh, a desire to, 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 be, to be racist or, you know, all, all the things that pe- pe- uh, people um, express. It comes from that sense of social pessimism, the, the pessimism about being able to overcome racism. Um, and as you say, I mean, uh, part, of, part, of the, um, part of the irony of that is that, um, um, you know, if anything the last 40, 50 years has shown, it is the possibilities of overcoming racism, of um, not that we've overcome racism, but certainly we've ameliorated racism um, to an extent that would have been unimaginable um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Um, so again, it comes back to, to, to my point that, that, that you have to understand this in the context of the wider shifts um, uh, in society, and and the wider sense of social pessimism that that has that that has um, uh, ripped many sections of, of society, which in your view comes from the economic dimension of all of this, basically, right? And political, and political. Uh, um, it's very interesting. Polit- so- sorry, I was going to say political because if you have, for instance, um, uh, social democratic parties um, um, in Europe, um, Democrats in in in, in America. Um, essentially cutting themselves off from their working class base, from their old working class base, yeah. um, then th- that becomes a, um, uh, and refounding themselves or, or, or think largely about um, uh, um, middle class support. Then um, you can see where that sense of betrayal and abandonment comes from. Well, right. There's no one. Whatever your skin color, there's no one you can vote for that's going to ch- uh, that's going to challenge authority on your behalf and represent your interest in in the conversation about how resources are distributed and so on. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, the question I wanted to ask you is how much of this, particularly the way we think about it in the UK, is imported from America, because. I feel that many of the conversations that we have in this country, they just don't seem to map very well onto the history and culture of this country and the society that we have here. Do you think there's a dimension where we're sort of living in this increasingly unified informational field? And so whenever a conversation starts in America, and BLM is a good example of this, it's sort of imported wholesale here and is applied in a very top-down way to a society that actually is remarkably different to America. Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, in the sense that um, you're right that um, the the economic, social, political heft of America means that what happens in America, the debates you have in America, um, necessarily apply to uh, uh, to, to um, other countries or get imported to other countries. The the most remarkable expression of that, that I've seen is that uh, I remember being in South Africa, uh, where there was a Black Lives Matter march. Now, anybody who knows South Africa will know that <laughs> the policing of black people in America is f- in, in South Africa is far more vicious, far more brutal than anything that goes on in America. I mean, it's brutal in America. It's, there goes the observer column, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> it goes far, 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 far more. Um, uh, you know, the, the shooting dead of of of, yeah. of strikers mm. um, by the police, and yet the march was not about. Um, police brutality in South Africa. It was about police brutality in America. Right. Um, and that kind of shows that, that, that there's a tendency when, 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 we, when, when we think about it in, 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 in American terms to ignore what is actually happening in front of our eyes on the ground where we are. So, um, yes, in that sense, I agree with you. But in the broader sense that we've been talking about, that what this... And, and, sorry, was, and, and, and this applies to Britain, of course. That the the, the, um, the, the character, the, the uh, uh, race and racism in Britain, um, and the relationship between different um, uh, cat- uh, of racial categories, racial groups, are very is very different in, in Britain than it is in um, the nature of immigration. All, all sorts of things are very different in Britain than it is in America. At the same time, going back to what we were talking about before. Um, the importance of what I call social pessimism in shaping the way we, 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 we look at um, uh, race and identity um, is as significant in Britain as it is in America. 
Um, so which, which is why, yes, I agree with you, but also that the, the, we need to take the, the wider frame into account too. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point that you made there. I guess one of the frustrations that I have is, you know, for instance, we say sex is a spectrum and we're not obviously not going to get into that. But race is a spectrum. You know, nobody is completely white. You know, nobody, you know, we, we talk, we, there's, there's this conversation right now happening in America, are Latinos white? You know, Asian people, should we, they be discriminated against when they come, when they apply for universities? Because, you know, they're, there's, they're overrepresented, particularly in STEM courses. And, and so it just seems to me that we just tend to think of these people as homogenous blobs almost whilst not actually drilling down. And I just wonder, is, do you think we're ever going to go to that point where, we, where we're ready to have a more honest and a more authentic conversation about race? Or do you think it's just going to be dominated by what we see at the moment? Well, I think the, the, this, the view of um, racial communities as being homogenous groups um, has been disastrous. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, because the people that, uh, again, go back to our Black Lives Matter discussion, the people it um, abandons are those at the bottom um, um, because you, you tend to, don't tend to, you tend to see um, minorities as uh, being single, homogenous communities. Um, the most, first, the most conservative voices often get... Um, uh, are seen as representative of those communities. So, um, I mean, this is most visible in Britain in, in Muslim communities, that, that, that somehow... Um, um, the Muslim Council Muslim, of Britain yeah, yeah. speaks M for the Muslim British Council. Muslims. You know, yeah. The, the, yeah, conservative Muslims are seen as representative and, and, and liberal Muslims are seen as somehow not authentic, not right. of that community. So I think um, th that view of, of, of communities as, as uh, minorities as a as forming homogenous communities has been disastrous. And we live in a world in which we tend to look at um, minorities as belonging to communities. And that class is something that applies largely to the white population. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have to, you know, the notion that the white, with the white but, but, but what that does, but is, right, ra right. what that does is racialize um, the concept of class. And so we have, you know, the notions like the white working class, where the whiteness seemed to matter more than their class location. Um, and, and, and again, that, that is um, really problem, really disastrous for the white working class, as it were, um, to view uh, that their, um, their, their problems in terms of race or ethnicity or culture, rather in terms of class, um, is, is, is deeply problematic. And for example, in education, which is where I used to work, um, the lowest achieving subgroup in education is white working class boys. Yeah, I, I, th I think um, education is quite interesting because if you take another issue um, in schools, that of um, school exclusions. Yeah. Um, um, this is seen as uh, uh, something that affects particularly uh, black pupils. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But actually, it affects pupils of um, Caribbean descent. It, uh, those of, um, uh, who are of black African descent are actually far less affected. Um, and that's because it's a class difference again. Um, uh, the, 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 un, until relatively recently, most um, uh, people from black, of, of black African descent in this country um, were more middle class than those who are of Caribbean um, descent. And so it's not an issue of um, simply of, of black pupils being excluded. It's a particular um, set of black pupils who, who tend to be um, more working class who are excluded. Uh, and as it so happens, um, white working class boys are also excluded, not, not, not to the same extent, but, but, but certainly more than um, uh, pupils of... Uh, uh, African descent, black African descent. So um, what is a complex situation? What is a complex picture? Then becomes 
seen in the kind of narrow, rigid um, uh, racial terms, which doesn't actually tell you much about what is happening, what is going on. Absolutely. And one of the highest achieving subgroups in education is West African girls, girls of West African heritage. They're absolutely crushing it in exams. You can see they're the ones who are going on to be doctors, scientists, lawyers, etc. They're doing fantastically well, yet nobody talks about this. And it just seems to me, again, that the problem is, is when you have a conversation that is not honest, Kenan, you're not discussing all facets of the problem. And when you're not discussing all facets of the problem, you're never going to solve that problem, which is my concern. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not a question of honesty. I think it's a question of the way we've come to view the world. I, I, you know, I, I think it's wrong to see this as somehow people being dishonest about, uh, about it. But we've come to f view the world and view the categories that matter in certain ways. Um, and those tell us actually very little about um, uh, the world as it is. So again, you know, we talk about Asians, about Asians in, in the American context, we talk about Asians in the British context. Um, and Asian means slightly different. For our American, American view, as an Asian person in this country, someone from the Indian subcontinent or yeah. whose ancestry is from that region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you look at social outcomes or educational outcomes, you find it's very different from those of Indian background to those of Bangladeshi and Pakistani background. Right. And that, again, has to do a lot to do with class um, because those of, uh, from Indian background usually come from, um, uh, a majority of them come from um, middle-class families. Mm -hmm. Those from um, Pakistani or, or, or Bangladeshi backgrounds come from uh, working-class or, or rural families. Um, and so um, just to, 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 the categories we use to think about these issues themselves obscure many of the problems we face. And again, uh, Asian in, in the American context, I mean, we're talking about a huge wide range of different communities, some of whom are very poor and do very badly in things like educational attainment, some of whom are uh, much wealthier and do very well in educational attainment. Uh, attainment. And, and to kind of put all of them into a single category, Asian, and, 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 and look at um, how Asians are doing in, 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 in different social, um, is to misunderstand um, the roots of many of the problems um, that, uh, that we face. I mean, uh, talking about American affirmative action, there's a, uh, I don't know if you saw, there was a paper came out last week, which looked at how um, at, uh, top colleges, Ivy League and, and, and top colleges in America, um, pupils with the same SAT score, um, but different uh, income levels um, did. And what they found, not surprising, but, but it's quite stark, stark in the way it showed it, is that with the same score, those who are in the top 1%, um, are, I think, twice as likely to uh, be offered a place at a top university than those who are um, uh, at, at the bottom um, uh, income decile. In other words, this is affirmative action for the very rich. Mm -hmm. um, and so those kinds of issues get missed out when we, when we, when we, when the categories we use to understand the world and how it works um, actually don't serve as well at all. I think that's a very good point, actually. And I think what Francis meant was that because we are quite often misled by a different worldview and misinformed about the right way to look at it, we end up having fake conversations, even if no one is being actively dishonest. No one may, people might not be going into it going, well, I know the truth, but I'm gonna say this. But we are having the wrong conversation, which I think is what you're saying as well. And actually, I mean, if you look at what you're saying, it's the most obvious thing in the world because there is a reason why people in society compete for resources. They want to make more money. They want to raise their status. And that is because deep down we all know that the more money you have, the better you and your children are going to do in life. That's just kind of how it works. That's why we want more money. That's why we want more resources. So you're saying something very, very accurate and obvious. And the late motif through this entire conversation, Kenan, has been the need to address 
the inequality that we see in our societies now. And we've got about 15 minutes left. I'd love to spend it talking about that with you um, because you are on the left and I sense that you are quite in favor of strong intervention in, in that uh, in in the market, if you like, or in the world, in order to address the disparities between people at the bottom and people at the top. How do we fix this? Hey, KK, do you like trigonometry? Of course I do. Incredible interviews, fascinating guests, phenomenal live shows, and hilarious raw streams. In that case, you need to join our locals so you can have access to even more brilliant content. That's right, you get the chance to win incredible prizes, ask our phenomenal guests your questions, access extra content, and now the only place to watch our Raws on Catch Up is on Locals. Our Raw shows still go out at 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern as normal. But if you want to watch them after this time, then you're gonna need to sign up to our locals. Raws have now become too spicy to stay on YouTube, so they're only available to watch back on our locals page. All you need to do to sign up is click on the link below this video, and for just $7 a month, you have access to all of this brilliant content. $7 a month, even for someone of my persuasion, that's a bargain. See you all on locals. How do we fix this? Can we fix this? Well, I, th I think the, the, the first, I mean, it's, it's uh, <laughs> to have a debate about um, the market and the capitalism. In, 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 Give in, us, in we don't need to have a debate. Yeah, Tell us no, what no, you think. No. I think that the, the first thing is that we live in a world where um, profit comes before need. So um, wherever you look at um, issues, where, you know, whether you look at energy or, or, or whether you look at um, uh, education, profit comes before need. And, and we, we need to, 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 to reverse that, to, to, to think about people's needs. Um, so if you're talking about um, uh, uh, income, for instance, uh, one of the big shifts over the past 40 years has been the um, removal of um, or, 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 or the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the curtailment of the rights of trade unions. Um, it's been made more and more difficult for trade unions to come out on strike, um, for trade unions to um, show solidarity with other trade unions, um, to, to have um, secondary action. All those things have, 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 have gone. And if, we, if we're serious about wanting to um, defend those at the bottom, if we're serious about wanting to defend the poor, if we're serious about wanting to um, uh, undermine inequalities, then you have to be serious about opposing those kinds of restrictions on trade unions. Because... Um, if you look right, to, if you look throughout the 20th century, those times when trade unions were strong, inequality was low. When trade unions um, uh, are weakened, inequality shoots up. There's a, there's a, uh, it's not true just of Britain. You can, you can, have, you can see the same picture in America. So, um, one of the, one of the things that that, 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 um, that, that always strikes me is that um, the question of class is now something that the, the, the people on the right take up, conservatives take up, so it's, it's an issue. But it, to me, it's as performative as um, left -wing, much of left-wing anti-racism, um, right-wing um, uh, defense of class, because they'll talk about class, but they won't do any of the things necessary to defend working-class people. The moment working-class people go out on strike, um, their the, 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 the argument is that we must do something to, to restrict the, 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 the rights of trade unions even more because they're still going on, on strike. So it seems to me that um, if we want to take seriously questions of class, if we want to take seriously questions of inequality, if we want to take seriously questions of poverty, then 
one starting point, not there are lots of um, uh, starting points, but one starting point has to be um, the, the, the removal of nearly 40 years of restrictions on trade unions to defend their rights. So, L- let me put, just push back on yeah. that at, at this point, Kenneth, yeah. because there'll be people sitting down watching this going, hang on a minute, mm-hmm. 1970s, mm-hmm. the unions were very strong, we had a three-day week, the, the UK economy was, quite frankly, decimated, we were known as the sick man of Europe, Thatcher came in, reduced the power of the unions, broke the power of the unions, Britain became a far wealthier and far more successful country. And what happened to inequality? Isn't that really the conversation, Kenan? Because yeah. I think both sides of this discussion always want to pretend that they have a solution, whereas if you're a neutral and uh, honest observer, what you see is there are trade-offs. So, for example, when you talk about we need to put need above profit, I lived in a society that put need above profit. Didn't work out very well, right? But that's not to say we should profit, put profit above need in all circumstances. There is a balance between the two, and we must look for the right place where that balance is, whereby we still have profit <laughs> and we still generate enough revenue or stuff or goods for people to enjoy in society, while, as I think you're right to say, making sure that in the pursuit of that, we do not leave people behind. Because I'm very persuaded by the evidence on this, which is... Uh, the well-being of a society, and there's a lot of statistical evidence for this, depends not so much on its absolute income, but on the distribution of that income across society. And I think the concern about inequality is something that I really share, actually. But the question I was going to put to you is slightly different, which is, in the 70s, yes, the unions were largely dismantled by a political force. But isn't the reason that we don't have powerful unions now more about the fact that the industries which lent themselves to unionization and that sort of power don't really exist? There isn't a million miners in this country now. There aren't, you know, that many bus drivers. There aren't that many. Yeah, there are some, but you're not going to get the working class united around this stuff because the working class doesn't really exist in the same way that it did 40, 50 years ago. Uh, There is a... A uh, large element of truth in that, but then um, partly it's also because um, one of one 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 way of looking at what you're saying is that work has to become fragmented, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that many of those who work um, uh, the kinds of jobs they have are jobs which um, in which employers make it very very difficult to unionize. Um, the gig economy. So if if you look at um, what's happening with Amazon now. Or Uber drivers or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But but there is a drive now to to unionize um, Amazon workers um, and to to, to, uh, improve their wages and conditions, um, which anybody who who, who, um, defends um, uh, the, the need to improve um, the 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 the, the, um, the 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 conditions, the wages um, of 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 those at the bottom of society, who who wants less inequality, has to support. Um, Just as an yet, aside, Ken, I, we had uh, James Bloodworth on the show to well, talk yeah. about his book about yeah. conditions uh, at Amazon warehouses. So I know what you're talking about. Um, but it's not just I mean, I mean, I mean that's where the focus is now. Yes, but there is the, the we've got to a point where it's very difficult to unionize, um, where um, it's very difficult to go out and strike, um, and that kind of collective action that um, that used to be part and parcel of working class life has gone, has disappeared. Um, and again, if, if we're talking about um, defending working class interests, if we're talking about defending the interests of the poor, then we have to also defend um, their ability to act collectively um, uh, as a group. Um, because um, as individuals, workers have very, have very little power. Um, the only way that they, they can express their power 
is through, act, uh, through collective action. And yet it's collective action that, the, you know, we live in a world where, where we fear collective action in that sense. So to defend collective action, to defend um, the idea that um, uh, something like the, the, the water companies should rip off the public, to defend the idea of a well-resourced, well-funded national health service. It's not to us to live in Russia. It's to, um, uh, to look at the problems we have now and say that if we want, we're serious about addressing these problems, um, then there are certain things we have to do. And Kenan, we are, it's looking more and more likely as the Conservatives are imploding in front of our eyes that we're going to get a Labour government, Keir Starmer, are you hopeful? No. <laughs> Why not? No, because um, I think it's made it clear that um, even, even minor changes um, to uh, improve the lives of those um, who are poorest um, is off the agenda. Um, I mean, we'll wait to see, you know, if there is a... Labour government, if there's a Labour government, and we'll wait to see, you know, what happens then. But no, I'm not. I'm not particularly hopeful um, that things will change. I mean, on uh, everything from from uh, uh, benefits to um, immigration, you know, the the, the, the policies that Labour follow um, are not that different from the policies that, that the Tories pursue at the moment. It's so interesting because you're not the first person on the left that we've had on the show who Francis has asked that question about the Labour Party coming in and the answer, usually it's very much the same. There's almost certainly going to be an incoming Labour government under Keir Starmer by the looks of the politics today as it is. Are you excited from your perspective where you sit on the left about that prospect? No. What's interesting as well is when we have people from the right on the show and we ask them about the Conservative Party, they feel exactly the same way about the Conservative Party. Sure. So it's almost like the, the, the Labour Party doesn't represent the left and the, and the Conservative Party doesn't represent what people want on the right. Which comes back to your point about social pessimism, because if you can't vote for a party that actually represents what you want, why would you be optimistic about the future? Sure. Oh, I completely agree. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird place for us to be in a society. Do you think something like proportional representation would help? As in, we'll get more, lots of more frag fragmentation and there'll be lots of smaller parties, which would then, the argument is, represent people better. If you want the progressive left, you can get, for example, the Momentum Party. If you want the old school left, you get something like the SDPs, for example. I, I don't think that... The answer, I mean, we can have a debate about, um, about proportional representation, um, good or bad, and, and there are arguments, um, I think, either way on this. But I don't think the, the problem is the mechanisms of, 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 of politics. I think it's, it's, at a, it's at a more profound le at level of ideas and of, and of um, organisations that can bring and, and, and belief in change. Um, it's at that level that um, the problem lies. Uh, and but how I, do you I, get people to believe in change if they can't vote for it? Because change isn't, isn't simply about voting. Mm. I mean, um, being able to um, organise collectively to bring about change, whether it's in, in a, in a, in a um, to change one's uh, housing conditions, to change one's... Um, uh, um, conditions of work, um, to improve one's wages. All those things are part and parcel of bringing about change. I mean, democracy isn't simply about putting a cross on a, you know, on a ballot paper every five years. It is about all that happens in between. It is about civil societies, about the organisations of civil society. It's the, about, it's the ability to be able to protest. It's, it's, um, it is the ability to take action collectively. All those things um, are central um, to a democratic society. And too often we, we kind of think that democracy is only about elections um, and forget about all the rest. And, you know, at a time when um, there are increasing curbs on protests, mm -hmm. um, I think we, 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 we should remember that, 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 that 
you know, authoritarian nation, countries don't um, often don't stop people voting, but they stop people protesting. They stop people being able to express their views. They lock people up for doing that. So it's important to, 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 to recognize that, the, you know, the, the issue isn't simply about voting. It, it, it is about all the, 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 the um, tumult of civil society and, and our capacity um, to, to get together and, and um, uh, to organize, um, uh, whether it's a union or a housing committee or whatever. It is, it is in that that the democracy lies. Ken, I think it's a beautiful point to end this section of the interview on. It's been really refreshing to hear your take on it. The book is not so black and white. We're going to go to your questions on locals in a second, but before we do, we always finish the main interview with the same question, Ken, which is what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that you think we really should be? Well, we talk about immigration obsessively, incessantly, probably too much. But despite our obsessive talk discussions about immigration, we actually have very little understanding of how the, um, the, 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 the policies that are being enacted um, to stem immigration um, um, uh, into um, Europe, into Britain, into, into America, into Australia, and so on, how they're changing the geography of, of the world. Um, and what I mean is this, you take something like the EU, over the past 20 years, the EU has um, created a set of um, deals with just about every coercive force in um, North Africa, in the Sahel, in East Africa, um, in the Horn of Africa, um, from militias to dictators. I mean, it began with a deal with Gaddafi when he was in a power in Libya. Um, it's made a deal with uh, Omar al-Bashir, the, 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 the former Sudanese leader who's wanted for uh, war crimes by the International um, uh, Criminal Court. Um, and it's effectively created, um, and it's made these deals um, with all these coercive forces to stop migrants from coming to the Mediterranean um, uh, to cross over to, to Europe. And what it's really done is created a huge kidnap and detention industry right across the region. And in so doing, it has um, uh, trampled over the rights and the sovereignty of most many of those countries um, because, because um, for EU cash, they have to put the interests of um, EU migration before they put the interests of their own peoples or, the, or their own economies. It's destroyed economies. Um, it is... Um, uh, turned lives of people in places like Niger upside down, a country which most people haven't probably even thought about. Um, and it's not just the EU. We, we can see similar processes in, you know, in America, in, in Australia, in Britain, um, of, use, of using... And, and the irony is that the, um, the argument um, for, 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 for these policies is that we, we need to protect our borders from, 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 from immigration. But in so doing, what, what rich countries are doing is trampling over the sovereignty and borders of poorer countries. And that's something that we rarely talk about. Um, that the way that um, the immigration policies of the rich countries um, are making poor countries subservient to their needs, their immigration needs, and uh, undermining, overturning um, local economies uh, and, and, and the needs of people. And I think that's some, it's a scandal. And I think we should, um, and the fact that we're not talking about it, it's also a scandal. Well, we've got more questions for you from our audience. Head on over to Locals, guys, where we will follow up uh, with more of your questions for Kenan. Why do the far left and the far right hold very similar opinions on Israel and Jews in general? 